for basic creative innovation funds for around new mobility services. And I predict that there's going to be some applications submitted with micromobility companies. In other words, receiving trade agencies getting uh, federal dollars to try stuff out. That's one place where I could see stuff out. But you've heard enough from us. Uh, let me know what's on your mind. Who has a question? Uh, right here, yeah. Um, so, are any of you familiar with the multimodal facility at Silver Spring, Maryland, which is going to incorporate light rail in the next uh, year or so, Purple Line, et cetera, <laughs> where you talked about if you've been to Silver Spring, that goes to what do you think about it? I believe it's the most uh, well used and appreciated station in the line. I'd like to say that because I live next to it. Well, as you, as you live next to it, I'm sure you know the, uh, the uh, problems that went into getting it sure. to where it is today. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I hope that they can uh, integrate all modes well the first time and get everything done on, on schedule uh, and not have a repeat of what happened uh, the last time we've been doing a build out of that. So that it sounds like this is part of the mobility hub movement. Is that the idea? Is that the yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's a national trend, yeah. which some of you may have thoughts about the idea being to centralized private mobility services in a particular location, often but not always at a transit stop, and give people more assurance that services like scooters and micromobility will be available there. I'm curious, do you guys have any thoughts about the, the relative desirability of that approach? Um, we think it's a great approach. Um, so, um, the city of Pittsburgh issued an RFP last year um, where they, the respondent had to put together a sort of mobility as a service consortium with other transportation companies. So it's been put together a group with nine other, with eight other companies. Um, we won uh, the RFP, and part of that RFP calls for us to install 50 mobility hubs in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and we think it's gonna be a great way to, to marry transit um, and other modes of transportation um, together. And an economic development tool for a lot of communities, right? So if you wanna make it easier for folks to get to certain parts of cities, you need to have ways for them to get there uh, you need to have wayfinding and placemaking, and transit and mobility helps to be part of that effort as well. So it's not just a transportation issue, it's also an economic development issue for a number of cities. I see lots of nodding. Everybody likes the idea of mobility. <laughs> There's no controversy here. It's a very boring topic. Uh, other questions? Yeah, right here. Yeah, so uh, my name is Zach. I'm the vice president of the DC Bar and Restaurant Workers Alliance here in DC. So what we see a lot of is kind of uh, during the day transportation, uh, but a really unique uh, kind of problem that bar and restaurant workers face is access to really any transportation uh, assets post midnight. Mm -hmm. uh, Metro is not running, Uber and Lyft are increasing prices. Uh, we just fought recently uh, at the Wilson Building a ban on micro mobility from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., which was completely <coughs> ridiculous. I think we'd all agree on that. Um, what is being done specifically with the companies that have been chosen, which I believe everybody here is in 2020, to kind of help support the real need of access between those hours, you know, 12 to 4 a.m. when a lot of people are getting off work, uh, especially on the weekends, uh, when transportation is either very limited or very expensive? Um, we support 24 hour, seven day a week operations in every market we operate in. Um, a lot of times it's not up to us, and I was at the, the um, Council uh, Ch uh, Chairperson uh, Che's hearing, mm -hmm. and we testified in support yep. of you guys. Uh, we were aligned with you guys on that. Yep. And hopefully in 2020, and we'll continue to operate 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, so they can provide service to folks who need it, like you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very much in agreement. I'm fully supportive of 24-7 operations. It's for obvious reasons. It's pushing pull between safety of operations, mm -hmm. when things go wrong, and then what are you doing to prevent that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that comes from the general, of, the general standpoint of who are you allowing onto the platform, how are you screening drivers, how are you holding your users accountable, but I think that's definitely the direction that we're going. How are you screening? So I know that you require driver's licenses for your vehicles. Correct. Are you encouraging, when you say how are you screening riders, are you encouraging other like scooter providers to, to actually uh, require some sort of check or, or license check to be able to use a scooter? No. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I think it's at some point there's a level of, I know when you sign up for micro building platforms, meaning scooters, oftentimes you have to opt in and say what your age is. Right. I think even with that, you see people riding that are 10, 9, that are underage, and I think you have to make a decision one way or the other of, are we truly making that a requirement or aren't we? Because right now it kind of feels like a, a false, false screen. Around age. Yeah. Okay. Do you think that there's so much talk now about safety issues around micro mobility? 
and people getting hurt. It's usually, for, to be fair, it's people hurting themselves. It's not people hurting others, which is the problem with, with cars and, and trucks. But still, there's a lot of people who hurt themselves on micromobility, especially it seems like we're in the data when they're just starting to learn how to do it. Should we take measures from a governmental perspective, or frankly, the companies themselves take measures to improve safety, or is there something else that should, we should do? Or is it frankly just an overblown issue? I feel very passionate about it. Again, with background in automotive, I think that very, very personally. Um, and I have a 12-year-old son, right? And I think what it demands is an evolution of the product itself, right? And I think, again, once you, our scooter, for example, is the only one that has um, cameras. Like, why well, can't we use, like, proper cameras and understand sort of what the, what the road is and how it's driven? I think the age restrictions is another one. And again, some of the heavier assets that are less flimsy is important, right? And so I think that's an issue that the industry is going to grapple, and I think it will lead to the evolution of the product and the evolution of sort of what is included in the product and how intelligent it can be. I would just say that, you know, it's been we, we took all of their ES4s um, out of circulation. We now only deploy the Max Scooter, which is about 45 pounds. Um, and it's designed specifically to be shared. It has pneumatic tires, to your point about creating a more ruggedized vehicle um, that's safer and it feels more comfortable for riders to, to ride on, on, on the street. Um, we educate our riders. Um, we provide a discount for riders, 30% discount on a foldable helmet. We do helmet giveaways. We do uh, rider training seminars. And a lot of those requirements are included in permit applications. So if you want to keep a permit with, uh, with the city of Baltimore or DC, for example, you have to do so many trainings and, and events in the community with the Department of Transportation in order to keep your um, your permit. We also do in-app notifications and, and on how to ride the scooter. But, you know, people need to use common sense, too. I mean, like, I mean, I don't frequently agree with the CEI, but, you know, there, there's an element to which people have got to, you know, be sensible. I was just going to say, let me guess, Mark, your, your attitude is the government should step in and ensure everything is going to be entirely safe. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Big regulatory response. I, mean, I, I think sort of what we've talked about. We're talking about uh, we're talking about a mode right now that is two one hundredths of one percent of total trips, uh, and you're really not externalizing a lot of these safety costs onto strangers, which is I think the major issue with automobiles. Uh, there's some of that if you run into someone on the sidewalk and they you can fall down and they can they can be hurt. Um, but compared to the normal operations of motor vehicles on our roads every day, this is small potatoes. I think safety should obviously be a concern, uh, but we shouldn't blow it out of proportion. Well said. Um, we have a really thoughtful final question. Oh, behind? I didn't think of that. Yeah, please. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <coughs> I was going to ask you, by the way, I didn't say anything wrong, so they have the corporate company as well. I'm curious, is there a role for uh, city slash state slash federal government to sort of get involved in standardizing the hardware. I mean, there's now a lot of like, you know, uh, U.S. funding from our team, spending funding from all of these, you know, uh, charging stations in uh, private, uh, private uh, uh, facilities and public problems. So I'm wondering, is there an opportunity for us to standardize at this early stage? Like right now, if you think about how you're just trying to get one single charger for all the phones. Yeah. Uh, and is there an opportunity for us to just have one charging station where anybody can come and dock? And also, to that point, I was thinking that we don't regulate other industries, like for example, healthcare, or even a car industry. We let anybody who has the capital come in and play. But there is a market mobility we can do that. Instead of just making proper accommodations for, uh, for them to play in the infrastructure side. We can't get future people in So I'm wondering, is there a role that we all have, uh, that we have a role to play together? Yeah, on the on the question of standardization, um, perhaps in the future, but I would I would say it, it, it is federal policy has been since 1996 that whenever possible these standards should be developed by by non governmental uh, uh, voluntary consensus standards bodies, the underwriters, laboratories, ANSI, SAE kind of places. That's where if you if you have broad consensus on a private standard, then perhaps it would be ready. It would be right for a corporation into a government regulation at a later date. I just mentioned uh, uh, 
the uh, uh, UL uh, 227 uh, <coughs> uh, that made for electrical system safety, that could be something where you have standardization across these types of vehicles, ensure you're complying with basic fire safety with lithium ion batteries. Um, maybe something for it, but I would, I would, I would, ra I would, if I want, if we wanted to see that eventual standardization by government, I think it should first come from the voluntary consensus, uh, consensus standards body outside of government. Uh, do you foresee a scenario where the city is going to dictate, hey, if you have to play in my market, I'd like to be certain to charging standards? I don't think that, the, I think the main thing right now is there aren't, there aren't many of these standards in existence. Now, they can be written, and I would encourage the companies to join these relevant standards committees, uh, many already are, are already part of them, uh, but to engage with these voluntary consensus standards bodies before, you know, you get to the point where regulators are deciding on, or, or worst case scenario, they come up with their own government unique standards. Uh, and then you're just left trying to figure out how to comply with that, and it may not be the best for for anyone. Why don't we why don't we, let's do it, like, why don't we pause it there? Um, before we tell you, I always like to say, you know, everybody here has strong opinions. Obviously, we can keep talking further. Um, I, I, I personally can always reach me at, at David Zipper on Twitter. What's the best you want to offer a way to connect with you? Uh, William at spin .pm. So yeah. uh, at Paul Sibley on Twitter. Julius Dane on LinkedIn. You go to ci.org, you can find my email address and other contact info. Uh, sure. Thank you to our panelists. And I think we go back over to you. Yeah, but very quickly, first of all, I just want to uh, thank uh, our panelists for uh, doing this. <laughs> I want to encourage everyone to ride a rebel, a bolt, and a spin uh, as, a, as a thank you. Uh, for uh, for doing this, and of course uh, joining CEI or uh, David Zipper fan club is always a space for all of you. Um, there's a policy document outside. Uh, that's just a couple page uh, document on some recommendations. We at Safe um, are going to you know, continue to, to, to move into this uh, space. We, we although it is one one hundredth of two hundredth of one percent. Uh, I do believe that uh, it's an exciting potential, and I think the goods. Space is another place that uh, you know. Here we talk about people, but you know the idea of uh, not having to uh, double park everywhere and take you know multi thousand dollar, a thousand pound vehicles to deliver you know dinner packages um, is something that we see great uh, economic opportunity, and I think that's an exciting space as well. So I uh, want to keep an open mind and uh, be part of this revolution. So thank you for coming, and uh, look forward to working with you all. Nice job. Very good. Thank you. No, no. I just need that call.